much for everyone who came out. I know it's bad weather and uh, probably bad timing and just maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a bad place, I don't know. But uh, uh, as Belinda says, I am an engineer and um, I suppose when you go into neuroscience as an engineer, you, you kind of want to be a neuroscientist because that's what you're meant to be doing. But invariably it just comes out of your kind of, your background of, of how you actually think and how you want things to work and you end up doing engineering projects without, without even knowing that you're doing them. And I had uh, kind of a couple of notes written down at about half six today, but I'm going to kind of dispense with them and just tell you about what, what, what I did in my PhD, what a lot of other people are doing around the world in kind of trying to use nanotechnology, first as a diagnosis uh, tool in neuroscience, and secondly, uh, more speculatively, as a, as a method of treatment, of treat, treating uh, diseases and delivering drugs. So when we talk about nanotechnology, it's this massive word that's almost too broad for it to actually have any meaning uh, because of the fact it's just technology prefaced with, with kind of a nano. Why not Pico? Why not Femto? I'm sure they'll come along. Uh, but the whole point being that it's anything that's at a tiny, tiny scale. And a nanometer is uh, one billionth of a meter. So we're talking really, really, really small. And the, the model or the, the output from nanotechnology that I'm going to use throughout my talk is a nanoparticle. And that's just a single piece of material that's really, really small. So we're talking maybe 30 nanometers, 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers. And the piece of uh, uh, nanotechnology that I use is an iron nanoparticle. And the reason we use an iron nanoparticle is because throughout all medicine, you always want to generate contrast, where they're using uh, an assay in a tube, which might turn green when there's something bad there, or blue when there's something good there. Or what we use a lot in neuroscience is magnetic resonance imaging, which allows you to get really exquisite anatomical detail of the brain. And magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI as it's known, I know people might have got scans here, it's affected greatly by iron. So if you have iron there and you have enough iron, you generate contrast and it allows you to see, listen, there's a load of nanoparticles there because that's not normal. It's not normal to have that much focal uh, populated amount of iron in the brain. That's our nanoparticles. So with our nanoparticles, we know we can generate contrast in MRI. And I suppose the challenge for an engineer is to take that technology as it exists and take what people already know about neuroscience and put them together and to use them uh, for the benefit of, 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 I suppose, people, to be able to turn them into diagnostic tools, to be able to turn them into treatments. And the first thing I'm going to talk about, because when we talk about neuroscience, we're talking about the brain. The brain is neurons and astrocytes and microglia and all these kind of things. Externally, it's protected by the skull, but also internally, it has a magnificent uh, um, mechanism of protecting itself from all the other bad things that's going on in the body. And that's called the blood-brain barrier. And this is a uh, as the blood comes up and it doesn't come in contact with brain tissue, there's a bunch of cells which always keep the blood away from brain tissue and they're called endothelial cells. And they're magnificent cells really, they're almost indestructible. Uh, they're quite flat and they kind of have a shape like that. And they protrude out of each, each kind of side of them uh, to the next guy. These, kind of, these things are called proteins and they're really long filaments and basically they bind into the other neighbor's proteins and they pull each other together to make these really tight junctions which stops 
other cells, which are in what's known as the periphery of your body, from getting into the, to the brain tissue and causing problems. Because you have a lot of cells in your, in your body that you don't want in the brain. And Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, stroke, in those conditions, those cells get in. And they exacerbate any problems that might have been already there. So a good question to ask is, how's your blood-brain barrier working? Is it leaky? How are those junctions forming? And the problem with the brain is it's not like the liver or something external here. We could actually go in and take a little bit of it, put it in a test tube, and do an in vitro diagnostic uh, and, and, and look what it is. You can't go in and take a bit of someone's brain and say, we're just looking, you mightn't be sick at all. We're just going to have a look. So we need to kind of change that around. And what we need to do is we need to have a kind of an in vivo diagnostic. And what we can do with the nanoparticles is we can decide, we can do a few tests and we can say, listen, we know that if our nanoparticles is 50 nanometers wide, and we, we put it into your bloodstream. Now, when you put nanoparticles into the bloodstream, where do they go? Well, they go everywhere. These nanoparticles, when they're just iron, that's no good because iron is, is, is exceptionally important in the body. And it's trafficked between cells, tied up in different proteins. And if you put iron just straight in itself, you're just going to get iron po poisoning. So the first kind of bit of nanotechnology that we want to use is we want to coat that nanoparticle in something. And we coat it in something called dextrin, which is uh, a fantastic substance that's been shown to be really, really, really well tolerated by the body. And uh, it's also quite inert. So when cells look at it, they go, what's that? Well, this doesn't really bother me. It's got nothing, no proteins. It's got nothing that I recognize. I'm not bothered about that. But what it does do is it means it allows these, uh, these nanoparticles to exist in the bloodstream for a long time. So if we get one person who has a blood-brain barrier that isn't working quite so well, and one person who has a blood-brain barrier who is, their blood-brain barrier is fine. They're not sick. And we do an MRI image of this guy, and we do an MRI image of this guy. And then we inject into their blood these nanoparticles. If these nanoparticles are small enough, at their 50 nanometers, and they stay in the bloodstream, and they end up in the brain, and we know that they don't get into this guy, the, the, the guy who's got the functional blood-brain barrier, they don't end up on the image of his MRI image, but they do in this guy, we know that we've now shown in vivo that their blood-brain barrier has got a problem. There's something wrong somewhere. So that's kind of the very... That, 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 that's the, the most primitive form of, of nanotechnology currently uh, going on. And that's moved from the lab into the clinic. And it allows you to test how a bunch of cells, which are meant to work as a big system together, even though they don't really know it, they're not an organ, but they're meant to work as a big system together, how they're working. Are, is, is this going well? Is this going bad? Now, that's all well and good. But you know, just because you've got a bad blood brain barrier, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world. You know, uh, These endothelial cells, um, they're, they're in contact with the brain. And a prevailing thought at the moment is that, listen, can we use these guys as kind of surrogate thermometers of the brain? Because we can't go in and take a chunk of your, your neurons and your astrocytes and ask them, how are you getting on? What's the story? We can't do that. So, but we can get access to the outside of these cells. So your brain tissue is in here, but the blood is coming up like this. So what we did in the first example is we found out that these tight junctions weren't working. They weren't together, and we saw that on MRI image. So the next step, the next advance is, well, can we interrogate these cells at a molecular level, what are they doing themselves? What's their cell machinery doing? Um, are they doing bad, bad things that aren't good, things we want to try and avoid? And one of those things is inviting other cells in. These endothelial cells, they can express certain molecules that allows other cells when they're um, just basically swimming around in the blood. And these other cells are known as macrophages. And these are essentially the police of, of, of the blood. So they go around, and if they find something they don't like, they take it, and they eat it, and they, they recycle it, and then they spit out any, any remains. But if these guys get into your brain, it's, it's a very, very bad set of, set of fears because they cause inflammation, they cause lots of changes, and they really, really they mess things up. So what can we do? Well, we can take our nanoparticle, which was just iron. We've coated it in dextrin. We can put another coat of uh, polyelectrolyte on it, just, just kind of a plastic. And then on the outside of that, we can put an antibody, which is essentially just a key looking for something that we know but if endothelial cells are expressing this, these endothelial cells are in distress. They're not, they're not performing well. They're, they're maybe uh, allowing cells in. They're causing a problem. So that's, that, that work is currently in the lab, and it's moving towards the clinic. But the more interesting stuff is, as I hope you've kind of gathered, is that the blood-brain barrier is really, really a great thing. And it's a bad thing when you want to deliver uh, medicine to the brain, because you can't get past it. It's a, real, it's a bit of a nightmare uh, to get past. And lots of people have lo tried lots of different tricks. Uh, and uh, lots of different tricks involving using na nanotechnology to move, make things called li li lysosomes, which are mem two membranes like this. And uh, they are kind of tolerated by the body, and sometimes they get in. But they're also quite toxic if they break. So it's not, not, not such a good uh, approach. But one technique that's coming out 
is instead of trying to get your nanoparticles to bypass the blood-brain barrier, can we get our nanoparticles into cells that can bypass the blood-brain barrier anyway? And one of the instances of that is in stroke. So when a stroke happens, you have a, a blood clot, and it's imperative that that's cleared as, 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 as quickly as possible. Thrombiosis is what it's called. It's basically clot busters. And when they, that's cleared, on the secondary reperfusion of the blood, you've no blood-brain barrier because that whole area has been, it's been uh, damaged uh, irreparably. And what happens then is all those macrophages and all those peripheral cells that we talked about, they get in. But the work that I was trying to do, and we had some success with this, was injecting in nanoparticles that would target those cells as they go to the brain and get them to bring uh, um, a drug with them. So by the time they get to the brain, they've been slightly reprogrammed because our nanoparticle has lots of different polyelectrolyte layers. And as the macrophage takes it in, it's trying to break it down. And it's all, some proportion of them are on their way to the site of the stroke. And by the time they get to the site of the stroke, they've, been, they've, 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 uh, they've uncovered this drug inside in the nanoparticle uh, inside their cell. And they've kind of decided, well, hold on a second. I don't need to be here. This isn't a bad thing. I'm going to dampen down my response to this, uh, to this uh, site of injury. And, uh, that then propagates, because then they start telling other cells about this. So what we were trying to do is to turn the body's uh, slight kind of poor defense into a better defense. Because when those cells get there, they exacerbate the problem. So we had some success with this, but it's still in its early days yet. Um, I have lots of other things I could talk about, but I don't want to kind of go on too long. I don't know how long I've been talking. Um, but the only other thing I really wanted to mention was that um, we might think it's great that we're, we're, we're making these nanoparticles and we're introducing them into the body and, and, and things are working. Obviously, there's a lot of toxicology issues and, you know, is this safe? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? But the thing that I, I recently heard is that cells have been making nanoparticles for years. They're called exosomes. And a cell, it'll take in a load of material and it'll try and work out what to do with it. And it, a cell is, like, amazing. It's got loads. It's got kind of a garbage disposal place over here. It's got a recycling place over, over here. But there's eventually, there's a load of... Uh, stuff that it just doesn't know what to do with it and it packages it up into a little vesicle and it kind of just puts it out into the extracellular fluid, it just gets rid of it and they're called exosomes. So if we were really, really smart, what we do is we'd use cells to make nanoparticles, the type of nanoparticles we want and we just introduce them instead of trying to make them ourselves but we're not at that stage yet. So I'm happy to take any questions, I know I flew through that but uh, uh, any questions at all and I'll kind of, I'll talk but uh, if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. And hopefully, uh, you know, that sort of thing will fly in the Viva next week as well. There's a lot of different ways you can prepare them. There's a, a top-down approach where you basically you keep breaking up uh, the material until you get it into small pieces. There's a bottom-up approach where you, uh, you, you make it almost through a series of chemical interactions in a wet lab that um, they're, they're almost a, not necessarily a, bri a byproduct, but they're, they're, they're not the intended use. You're making a solute and something else comes out of them. Uh, a lot of technology has been developed, uh, specifically TEM, to work out the size of these guys. TEM is transmission electron microscopy, and it's a really clever bit of kit, and allows you to work out, work out the size of these. But there's different ways of making these, and people come up with different mechanisms that allow them to control different variables of the, um, of, uh, of the nanoparticles. So in terms of iron, some people have a really, really good ability to make them with um, very very slight range, uh, size range. So it's, it's, it's either it's from 90 to 110, but there's very few outside of that. And that's quite a feat. Um, a lot of early kind of work in this meant that they were going from maybe 30 to 250 nanometers. And you had all the different interactions that, that would bring in terms of uh, accumulation, agglomeration, and all this kind of stuff. It's, the toxicology thing is the big worry. And that's why a lot, of, um, a lot of companies, when they use specifically the iron nanoparticles, which are used massively uh, in conjunction with MRI to generate contrast. Um, uh, they're always coated in dextrin. And it's, it's, I think there, there's, there have been two or three kind of reports of um, a very bad reaction to that by patients, but that would be two to three and maybe 500,000 uh, treatments. Just 
does that also prevent rusting? Because iron is very prone to rusting. Dexter, I don't uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> but this is it, you see, nanotechnology, it's such a broad name that I mean, I, I've chosen like a really, really narrow field, like just nanotechnology, specifically in neuroscience, specifically in MRI. Like nanotechnology really applies to uh, everything. I mean, in ter specifically, what's probably going to come out first in all the nanotech stuff is all the materials, because we're not going to be ingesting the materials or injecting the materials into us. So chairs made of nanotechnology, I know it might, might sound a bit funny, but they'll be 10 times lighter and 20 times more strong. That kind of stuff is going to come first because uh, the kind of the safety aspect of it won't be as strong as if we were going to inject it into people. Yeah, there, there isn't a whole ton of difference. Um, the therapeutic application. So when you, when you just inject in the dye and you see blood flow and you see whether the blood-brain barrier is uh, open or closed, basically you're just seeing how a, a particular bunch of cells are functioning. When, if you want to kind of move on from that and you want it to be a treatment, you can remove the iron from the core of the nanoparticle and, and try and get a drug in there. And then if you have your, your dextrin on the outside, so you're no longer in a situation where you're going to generate MRI contrast. But if you want your nanoparticle to do something different in the body, you have to use what's called biofunctionalization, which is a terrible, terrible word. But basically it means that you start adding on to your nanoparticle uh, um, proteins or antibodies, basically um, chemicals that cells recognize as, as trustworthy for either ingestion into the cell or to tell a cell not to go near it. So if we can find say something very simple, a pathogen that, that macrophages always take up and we, we inject it into the bloodstream and we know that we can get a specific cell to always take up this nanoparticle and then we know that during stroke this cell causes a lot of problems in the brain then we know that we can control them. Oh, true, you're always only going to be working on a certain proportion but I mean Compared to what you would get when if you just injected in a, a, a drug into the bloodstream, you'd have it passively distributing everywhere. If we just get 10% of the, say, 10% of macrophages that are going to the site of the stroke, if we can control just those 10% and get those guys, when they get there, to put out the signal that, lads, damp it down, this isn't that big a problem. I didn't hear you there, sorry. I keep, I keep on moving on the floor when you're about to talk. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do, because the, the, the human body response to stroke when there's a reperfusion is terrible. It exacerbates the problem big time. So you have blood running back into the, um, into the, the area that, that had no blood for maybe you know, 10, 12, 24 hours. And then along with that blood, you have a compromised blood-brain barrier. So you have all these macrophages, NK cells, T cells, all these guys rushing in as well, because they can get in. And, they, and they, they see this as a problem and they want to help, but they're not used to that situation. They've never been there before and they exacerbate the problem. They, they kind of, they, they ramp up the neuroinflammation that's going on. So if we can slow that down, we can rescue some of the function of that tissue. And that's what we're trying to do by getting the macrophages, some proportion of the macrophages that do arrive there to discover the drug that we've, we've asked them to, to ingest by the time we get there. And when they're there and instead of the, those guys kind of propagating that problem, we're going to try and return them around, turn, turn their response around a little. Oh, you're, th you're talking about around the rest of the body? Oh, yeah, but I mean, you know, when you have a stroke, you kind of have to, there's always going to be side effects, I suppose. But I suppose... Oh, that's not, that's not in the clinic yet, that's still in the lab, that, that kind of trying to modulate the, the, the body's response to, uh, to an event. But it's, it's, pro it's very promising, and a lot of people have done it a lot better than I have. I mean, I, I, I've, I've seen it work, but I've, you know, I, can, I can give you papers of people who've done it a lot better than me. But 
I, I totally take what you're saying, and I think the point is that like it's okay con changing what's going on up here, but you're also changing what's going on around the rest of the body. But when you have a stroke, I suppose your major focus will be on, on, on maintaining as much neuronal function as you can at the expense of maybe other, other, other small infections that might go on around the rest of the body. I'm not sure. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you can't really legislate for because of the fact that when you in, in, invite in this much kind of active material, when you biofunctionalize it, you don't really know where it's going to go. And you, you're only going to learn by doing lots and lots and lots of testing. Yeah, I, I, I use an animal model for stroke, and we, we, we try and reverse the whole situation. We've had good success there. Um, uh, but, you know, you have, to, you have to show a lot, a lot more than good success for, for, you know, to start injecting it into humans. But uh, there's, there's a movement towards trying to find a way to control cells uh, via the bloodstream, because the bloodstream is your kind of most active port. So you can always get something into the bloodstream. So especially in neuroscience, it's, it's, it's the big problem is getting a drug to the brain. You know, there's lots of great peptides that people have shown in the lab work great when you put them in a dish with neurons. You know, they stop being affected by A-beta, they stop being affected by lots of stuff. But they can never get into the brain because when you inject them into the bloodstream, they just circulate around the blood, a small, small, small propor proportion gets in. So it's all about trying to bypass that blood-brain barrier. A lot of other techniques uh, involve um, uh, I suppose it's not necessarily a nano. Everything is a nanotechnology when you're talking about cells. Uh, is uh, RNA interference, and this is a really, really clever bit of kit. So you remember those uh, proteins that I talked about? That, that they, they go out from each cell, from the endothelial cells, and they pull the cells together and they form the tight junctions. These, 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 this kind of mechanism is renewed every 24 hours. So they're con the cells are constantly making this tight junction. So if you could interfere with this tight junction uh, by basically stopping the cell having access to the DNA, which, which kind of, which I suppose, scripts the making of that protein. And you, you can do that with, with this thing called RNAi interfer RNA, RNA interference. You can stop those tight, uh, tight junctions from forming for about 24 hours. And at that point, you can inject in the cell. But you still have the problem of how do you get it to just the endothelial cells. So it's all about site-specific action, if I can use a kind of a drug company term. And uh, it's all about can you make sure that whatever you want to happen is happening at a specific site. And what we're trying to do with the, with the, the kind of nanotech is instead of trying to design the drugs to go to a specific site, we're just going to design the drugs to get into cells that are going to that site anyway. Mark. Do I understand you correctly that blood, I mean, blood obviously gets into the brain? Well, not necessarily. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, you should just say something, what, what that barrier actually means? Yeah, yeah. So, as, as the blood comes in, it, goes, it gets into smaller and smaller vessels. And basically, the glucose, the, the uh, hemoglobin, is taken out of the blood, and it's transported into brain tissue across a barrier, which is sometimes just, a, well, I don't get, sometimes just endothelial cells would say that. So you don't actually have blood swimming in around your neurons or anything like that. You have what's called cerebrospinal fluid and the kind of the extracellular matrix of the brain, for want of kind of better phrasing. Um, so the, the blood never really gets there. And the whole kind of concept of a lot of my work was, well, we know that blood touches these endothelial cells. We know that these endothelial cells are talking to the neurons and the astrocytes and all your, your kind of constituents of the brain. Can we use these endothelial cells as a thermometer for what's going on in the brain? Uh, because you just can't get the neurons to, to kind of ask them questions uh, diagnostically. So it was a roundabout way of asking a question of what's going on. So did you say so glucose and what else? Uh, hemoglobin, which brings the oxygen. And lots of other things as well, lots of proteins, lots of, uh, well, hormones could get in a different way, which is kind of a little more open. But, um, so, uh, and you could modify those with some things that you want to get through? Um, well, <laughs> hemoglobin and, and glucose are, are pretty important. Like, uh, they're, they're essential, really. That's so I mean, if you modify some of it, that it still looks like glucose. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of people do that. A lot of people try that. They, they, they latch on sugars onto nanoparticles and things like that to try and get them to bypass in through the endothelial cells. But again, you know, it's another approach, and I definitely would knock it, but, and it shows good, good, um, uh, good results. It's another approach, you know? Oh, sorry, I'll turn my back on people. Sorry, sorry there. Uh, uh, what, what 
what size comparison are we talking about between these uh, 50 nanometer particles uh, and the uh, uh, macrophages and you know, the yeah. sort of cell A cell can be, let me, let me get this right, you'll notice as well. Uh, a cell can be almost like 200 microns. Okay. And, and a 50 nanometer, I oh, didn't do the maths there. Yeah, you're talking one two hundred thousand. No, one one two thousand. Sorry, um, and we, it's actually I, I was going to bring some pictures along, but I decided against it. One of the things we do as well when we're, we're in the early stages, when we want to know where are these nanoparticles going, we tag them with a bit of fluorescence, so we can look at them afterwards. And you can see these beautiful images sometimes of cells that are of loads of fluorescence um, in and around their cell body, and it really lights up the cell. And you can see lots of dendrites going out and somas, and, and it's really really nice pictures and stuff like that. So there is, you know, you can get a lot of nanoparticles into a cell, to, to put it like that, you know, you, you really can load them quite heavily. But, but I mean, you know, the, the, the idea would seem that if you make the particles small enough, uh, you should be able to uh, get them past the barriers. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately drugs are quite large, uh, so you, you have a kind of um, uh, a problem, so you might get the, your particles in, but your particles are no good unless they're drugs, unless they're going to change things. So drugs are quite big, peptides are quite big, antibodies are quite big compared to the tight junction. And it's all been designed like that to stop all the stuff that's circulating around the rest of your body getting into the brain and causing a problem. So in some ways you're trying to bypass what is a great design, but kind of falls down because we want to bypass it. Now Medtronic, lots of companies make shunts, which are essentially basically things that go into your, into your brain and just deliver uh, uh, drugs to your cerebrospinal fluid and then that kind of dissipates around your brain and they, they can be quite good but they're hugely uh, uh, a huge intervention and you know you've massive amounts of surgery you've massive amounts of risk of infection and things like that so uh, if we can find another way of doing it that'd be great some people also use uh, this technique uh, called high frequency ultrasound which blasts the endothelial cells of the blood brain barrier and stops them from functioning and that kind of opens up the blood brain barrier again but there's a significant amount of trauma associated with that as well uh, although that is an interesting technique because you can be quite um, well, kind of accurate about where you're, where, where you're opening the blood brain barrier. Yeah, I suppose this again goes back to the whole <laughs> what's nanotechnology, like, you know, is a drug not a nanotechnology anyway? But um, yeah, they've, they've, they've done some really, really uh, good uh, lab studies on showing gold and silver uh, nanoparticles being particularly effective at restricting tumor growth. As far as I know, they are moving on to trials. But, uh, the, you know, that's, that's just a step, a step up. The kind of, the, the, the next level is, those kind of particles, which additionally also disrupt the mitochondrial function of cancerous cells, and, and you know, and for, form, start influencing the molecular uh, status of cells around them. So it's always that kind of additional step. It's okay just being a nanoparticle on your own and, and causing a problem just by your very unusual uh, kind of chemical reactions. But if you can influence a cell and start telling a cell what to do, then it's a, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a kind of a much more advanced treatment.